Welcome to the Armenian News Network, Rung, week in review for September 15, 2024. We're recording this episode on September 17, and 364 days have passed, almost a year, since the disastrous war in September 2023, which culminated in the ethnic cleansing of Artsakh. Dozens of Armenians, including the military political leadership of Artsakh, remain in Azerbaijani captivity and their suffering continues to be met with widespread indifference by global governments, which unfortunately includes the regime in Yerevan as well. Today we're talking with Dr. Sergei Melkonyan. Hello, Sergei. Welcome to the show. Good morning. Good morning. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Let's remember yet another somber anniversary, which unfortunately has been far too common for Armenians around the world since 2020. This somber anniversary is September 12 to 13 of 2022. And it has been more than two years since the Azerbaijani war on Armenia on that date, which ended up uh, with occupation of more than 200 square kilometers approximately the size of Yerevan, uh, in Vyosor and Sunik. In the aftermath of that military activity in 2022, we have the following situation. More than 200 soldiers were killed. Some were brutally murdered in what can be described as a full-fledged war crime. In Jermuk, one of Armenia's most touristic cities, Azeri soldiers are less than five kilometers from the town. We're not aware that Armenia is pursuing any international legal action related to these war crimes, and in fact, a full list of names of the victims was never released, and the anniversary of such a tragedy, shamefully, was not observed at the state level. We can't recall one being observed last year, and it certainly wasn't observed this year. And despite the demarcation and delimitation ostensibly being presented as a fair mechanism for resolving border issues, Aliyev has said he will never leave those territories, and Armenia, under Pashinyan, has said that we will never seek to liberate those territories. Following those violent events two years ago, again, this is September 2022, Pashinyan in parliament said that we want to sign a paper for which we will be called traitors. And indeed, next month, on October 5, 2022, Pashinyan went to Prague to sign away Artsakh. So any thoughts about this commemoration, this anniversary, and... Just, I mean, let me begin with a simple question. Why isn't the Pashinyan regime releasing the names of the heroes who gave their lives for their nation? You know, this seems to be like a very trivial thing. Why is this being deprived from Armenians? Thank you, Hovig It's a complicated question. But let me start from another one. I mean, one of the key consequences of the temporary lose of our Sakh uh, is actually destroying the narrative that the Artsakh, so-called Artsakh issue is uh, the only obstacle to, to, to reach the peace with Azerbaijan. So we see that, okay, Azerbaijan, Republic of Artsakh, de facto does not exist anymore on the ground. But still, one year after, we do not have peace deal. We don't have even discussions around real peace deal because it's important to mention that all meetings and negotiations between Armenian and Azerbaijan officials are around uh, the normalization of Armenian and Azerbaijan relations. So this paper, the title of this paper actually is not the peace deal between Armenia and Azerbaijan. So this is about general principles of international law on how relations should be established, communication should be un unblocked, etc., etc. Um, yes, and we see that Artsakh was the obstacle for Azerbaijan to make more pressure on Armenia. Uh, in the beginning of this year, I did a research, and it will be published next month, on how did the military situation change on the ground since the Russo-Ukraine war. And I did the whole timeline of official statements from Russians about the and Armenians of violation of ceasefire regime. And you can see that Azerbaijan was not able to make uh, the military pressure simultaneously against Artsakh and against Armenia at the same time. For example, two months they used military pressure against Armenia, two months against Artsakh, and they just combine it month by month. Now, when Artsakh does not exist on the ground, temporary, 
Azerbaijan is able to make full its military pressure against Armenia. These are the general consequences. I mean, it's in terms of security for Armenia. And coming to why, uh, as far as I understand what your question is, why Armenia is not putting on the agenda the issue of uh, our political military leadership. Uh, because as far as I understand, um, from Armenian authorities, um, this political military leadership is also a threat to their power. Uh, because I let us try to do a content analysis of uh, Aliyev's statement and Nikol Pashinyan's statement uh, on Ruben Vardanyan. They're using even similar, same wording. Like, we do not know who did send him and what were his purposes of coming to Artsakh. Like the same discourse that is spreading Aliyev, we hear here in Yerevan. So obviously for, I mean, in Azerbaijan experts, they, um, they agree with it, that the current Armenian um, leadership is the best one that Azerbaijan may imagine. And in case of uh, Ruben Vardanyan may be in power in Armenia, this is not the best case scenario for Baku. This is why, as far as I see, both uh, Aliyev and Pashinyan are not interested in having political military leadership of the Republic of Artsakh in Armenia. And in fact, going back to the political uh, leadership of Artsakh, Pashinyan, in fact, did say that we should still find out how he uh, left you know, Russia, how he ended up in Artsakh, who gave him those instructions, etc. So fully, fully uh, backing the uh, Aliyev regime, uh, you know, the statements of the Aliyev regime. But... My question was more around the fighting in Jermu two years ago, and I'm just still dumbfounded why you know the Armenian government is not even um, you know these are heroes who gave their lives, two hundred or more of them, and uh, they're not publishing their names. So you know, I, I thought it would be a very simple question to ask why. I mean, the, the question I guess is is short and simple, but maybe the explanation is more complex. I have my feelings that uh, the hero, the brave history of Armenia is wrong for them, actually, because we see that all history is rewriting. So we don't have Armenian history in Armenian schools. We have history of the Republic of Armenia. Uh, the history of First Artsakh War is not important. Uh, the history of 2016 war, when we did not allow Azerbaijan to do what Azerbaijan did in 2020 is not so important. So the brave uh, pages of Armenian history are not relevant in contemporary Armenia as far as I see. Because from their perspective, as I understand, it may create um, bad ground for communication with Turkey and Azerbaijan. So this is why we, uh, we didn't see on official level any statements from Armenian officials on Jermuk war, as we call it in 2022, we didn't hear any official statements from, I mean, Armenian authorities on Artsakh Independence Day. Like all these issues, they are trying to uh, to, to forget. And this is, um, this calls constructivism. And you try to construct a new identity uh, around new, a new agenda around new identity that, for example, let's forget this page, we should focus on peace, etc., etc. So, I mean, that's obvious. So, two years ago, the Jermuk War happened. And as I said, on October 5, uh, Pashinyan went to Prague and made those, the statement that he did, recognizing Artsakh as uh, part of Azerbaijani territory. Did that statement legitimize in any way Aliyev's blockade and uh, ethnic cleansing of Artsakh less than a year later, in September 2023. Yeah, obviously. I mean, the only obstacle was Armenian position on the Nagorno-Karabakh status. And, for example, as far as we know, Russians during negotiations in Moscow, they were suggesting to freeze this issue and to focus more on like peace deal between Armenia and Azerbaijan and to postpone the the status of Nagorno-Karabakh and to get further generations to work on it. So let's freeze the current status quo. But then uh, Nikol Pashinyan actually changed the status quo because uh, recognizing Nagorno-Karabakh as a part of Azerbaijan, he opened the door for Azerbaijan to 
um, use force in order to uh, implement uh, their rules on their territory. As far as this territory is Azerbaijani from Armenian perspective, it means that for all international community, this is Azerbaijani territory. So this is not disputed area anymore. If before that was disputed area, and Azerbaijan was well, Azerbaijan was much more complicated to legitimize using force. Now, uh, actually, Armenia legitimized all Azerbaijan using force, and yes, so this is why we didn't see any consequences for Azerbaijan. We didn't see any consequences. I mean, in terms of ethnic cleansing any statements or any decisions from Russia and any decisions on the West, from the West, where actually Armenia and Azerbaijan agreed on this on this part of peace deal. Uh, but as far as we know, this is not anymore a, a value-oriented foreign policy coming from Western countries. And it's complicated to force them to use any tools against Azerbaijan as Azerbaijan conducted ethnic cleansing in Artsakh, because the role of Azerbaijan has dramatically increased for the EU. We know the statements of uh, from the EU that Azerbaijan is a reliable partner uh, after the ethnic cleansing. And now Azerbaijan stated that EU actually wants to have Azerbaijan um, not as a mediator, but as a platform to have a dialogue with Russians, to be a mediator in terms of uh, cooperation in energy with Russia. So the role of Azerbaijan for the West and for the Russians is increasing. So this is why both Russia and the West, they are losing their leverage on Azerbaijan. Sergey, one more question. As we know, the Joint Commission on the Limitation and Demarcation of the Mutual Borders between Armenia and Azerbaijan, which is comprised of you know, both Armenian and Azerbaijani experts, uh, was supposed to release its guidelines uh, in on how they're going to do this uh, delimitation and demarcation. Uh, the de deadline was in July, I believe, but it came more than a month late. And even after reading it, for me, it is very ambiguous whether these lands around Jermuk, the size of Yerevan that are captured by Azerbaijan, will be given any priority. Because as we know, Prior to the signing of these principles, Armenia unilaterally handed over territories in Girans and Tavush, and these territories were critical for the viability of those communities of the entire region, and as well as north-south communication. Uh, so Armenia just agrees to give these territories, and my logic would indicate that the next in priority should be territories occupied by Azerbaijan that are obviously Armenian, such as Jermuk uh, or surroundings of Jermuk. And is my understanding correct that essentially this is not a priority for Armenia? We know Aliyev's threats. Aliyev said that he will never give these lands. So, uh, you know, uh, is, is Aliyev prepared to change his mind sometime soon? I don't think so. So is it my understanding that it will be a long time, if ever, that these lands will be delimited and demarcated and Azeris will relinquish them. Um, coming to the developments that took place in the first part of this year, I mean, um, the transferring of village to Azerbaijan. First of all, we should mention that it has nothing with the limitation demarcation process. So that was a fake demarcation. As far as our border still is not delimited with Azerbaijan. Uh, but I will agree that um, Azerbaijan was ready to use a force against Armenia in order to get these villages and to get so-called enclaves that in Granada Nikol Pashinyan recognized as the Azerbaijani territory. Because even when Nikol Pashinyan stated that if we do not transfer this territory, uh, if we don't give this territory to Azerbaijan back, we will use force. Actually, Aliyev did not disavow such statement. So there was zero statement from Baku that we are not using uh, force or threat of use of force as a tool of foreign policy. It means that that was right. The Azerbaijan is continuing to use military pressure, but it doesn't mean that we should uh, uh, should give them our territories in order to bring peace. So one day you will lose all territories and you will not get a peace. Coming to viability and Jermuk, yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, I have some friends living in these areas and 
um, during conversation with them that they are frank that it's um, complicated to stay there for a long time. I mean, to plan their life, having children there, uh, because they do not feel themselves safe despite despite the propaganda, despite um, performative measures that like we will uh, have trees here like that will serve as a border, etc. So and and this is actually a problem. The population of uh, border areas is in the short term run maybe key security problem for Armenia. Sergey, there's been some uh, very heated diplomacy since Putin's visit to Baku three weeks ago. After Iran's harsh criticism aimed at Moscow, Secretary of Security Council Sergei Shoyu clarified Russia's position to his Iranian counterpart, Ali Akbar Ahmadian in St. Petersburg. He said that there's no change in policy, there's no changes to borders or sovereignty planned, but he said they want Armenia to comply with point nine of the November 9, 2020 ceasefire agreement. In fact, after Ahmadian's visit to St. Petersburg last week, today Shoigu was in Iran. I guess there was more clarification to do. Do we know what is under discussion specifically between Shoigu and Ahmadian, what's being said, and also if Iran's concerns are being alleviated through these conversations? Yes, the key issue that is on the agenda on uh, Russian-Iranian relations is the signing a strategic partnership agreement that they are working for more than a year. And most probably they are they were planning actually to sign in in Kazan during BRICS summit that will took place in October. And now is this is part of preparatory work. As Shoigu is the head of security council, it means that he's coordinating um all this process. Because the Security Council is a bit above all ministries, Minister of Defense, Minister of Foreign Affairs, etc. Um, and yes, as far as Iranian colleagues told us, uh, the so-called Zangzur Corridor was also on the agenda. And if, for example, last week, uh, Russian MFA stated that um, we hope that Iranians get our position, as far as I understand, that was a kind of wishful thinking. Because, for example, uh, I got a message from our colleagues asking what was the reaction from, I mean, Iranian media on Shoigu visit, what they are talking about. Um, the official news is that they are supporting our stances in Caucasus. So it means that this is not one-way road. So Iranians are trying to um, insist on their position despite of pressure that is taking place from Azerbaijan, from Turkey and from Russia without any strong Armenian support. That's important to note that uh, literally for the last 10 days, every day we hear statements on different levels from Iranian officials, members of parliament, minister of foreign affairs, security council, ambassadors, etc., etc. We do not have, didn't hear any active um, statements from Armenian officials on all levels or so-called Zangizur corridor. Uh, nor, nor is anybody asking for their opinion, by the way. Nobody's mentioning yeah. Armenia or what Armenia thinks because it's they're irrelevant, frankly. Maybe yes, but it also depends on that Armenia, Armenian position is not so strong enough. Yeah. So yes, once you state that the corridor logic is unacceptable for us, mm -hmm. and that's it. But you should um, voice your red lines every time. Because if you raised once and you didn't raise, for example, in month, month uh, or two months later, or half a year later, it means that maybe something has changed in your position. That's right. That's right. So why is Russia so motivated to have a, a control over this corridor through Armenia? What's in it for Russia about this? Okay, I can try to explain Russian perspective. How do they see it? Mm -hmm. And. That, that was my hypothesis, and I tested it with Russian colleagues, and they agreed that this is right. So this is why this is, um, this is their perspective that we, we checked it. Um, what Azerbaijan did for the last year and a half, Azerbaijan was trying to sell to the West that this corridor is a good idea for the West. Then we had a statement from O'Brien that this is good to have uh, this communication in order to connect Turkey with Central Asia via Armenia and Azerbaijan. Because Georgia is becoming uh, much more problematic because of 
ruling elite, etc. Mm -hmm. So from their perspective, uh, if we have problems with Georgia, I mean, from the US perspective, it's better to uh, use Armenia that is ready to be closer with us, with the West. And we will be a key peace brokers in the South Caucasus that actually was historically Russian or Iranian zone of influence. So if Democrats are not able to demonstrate their success in foreign policy, I mean, in terms of bringing peace in Ukraine or bring peace into Israel and Palestine, so they can use um, their advantage that they have in the South Caucasus. And this is why they're trying to use their diplomatic efforts in order to force Azerbaijan to give any paper to Armenia. But we finally are close to the peace deal, then Armenia will go this, this paper to Turkey mm -hmm. and to show Mr. Erdogan that we have filled all Aliyev's demands. So we, Aliyev has zero demands. Now we're just discussing technical issues. Let's open the border because the Turkish uh, position is until you didn't solve all problems with Azerbaijan, until Azerbaijan has uh, even one demand, I'm not going to open a border with you. This is why from Western perspective, it's important to bring paper, to give paper from Aliyev to Pashinyan. Pashinyan will give this paper to Erdogan and this communication will be open in, and Turkey will have a direct access to Central Asia by passing Russia and Iran, untouching Russia and Iran from each other. Uh, then Azerbaijan knocked Russian door and told that the opening the corridor is not the matter, it's not the issue of uh, will it be open. It's an issue when it will be open and who will control it. So, I mean, this is from Azerbaijan perspective, this is solved issue. So it should be open. So now we're discussing who will control it. As far as you know, uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan are discussing to have a uh, private international company, right. uh, some control over this communication. And that was, as far as I understand, a kind of new formula because, I mean, for Armenia and Azerbaijan, it's clear that um, it's complicated to bring the pure West to the border with Iran. This is why they're trying to find a formula that they, that will be private international company. But this is not a company from India, from China, from Arab Emirates, that obviously it will be a Western company. And um, that was Azerbaijani position. That we may bring Western company here, but if you want to have a presence, we may use Article 9. And this is why from Russian perspective, they had a choice. Communication will be unblocked under Western control or should be unblocked under our control. So there is no discussion that it should be unblocked neither Western nor the Russian control. Because Russians, they did not worry so much, for example, a year ago about the communication because it was not on the agenda. It was not clear that the West is going to control, etc. Now they became more active because this is actually going to be under Western control. Because as far as I know, during negotiations between Armenian and Russian officials, the Russian position was... If you want to open this communication, you can open. And so we do not care about the uh, any large Russian presence. Because in Moscow, they have discussed, and that was 2022, actually, um, that Russian presence uh, should be limited. And all communication should be under Armenian sovereignty. And the only role that Russians had to play is to be a mediator between, a Russian, uh, between Azerbaijani citizens and Russian citizens. For example, Azerbaijan citizen is coming uh, from Azerbaijan to Artsakh and to Armenia. Uh, there is an Armenian custom control mm -hmm. and there should be Armenian border control. And in order to avoid a direct physical contact between Azerbaijani citizen and Armenian citizen, there should be Russian technical staff that is uh, taking passport to Azerbaijani citizen, giving to Armenian uh, servicemen, he is putting stamps, and this Russian uh, serviceman is giving back this passport to Azerbaijan citizen to, on the technical. Uh, so this is not about losing the um, communication in in the short term run. That that might bring the lose of communication in the long term run. And I've stated that problem in Russia many times that we have uh, the history of uh, the Berzor, the Lachin corridor, that it was fully under someone's control. Well, I'm not, for example, mentioning who, 
but it was under Russian control. But one one day it was fully under Azerbaijani control. So you 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 were not able to handle it. So we do not have guarantees that you will be able to handle this problem now in Sunik. Or, but I'm not take, talking that some private international company is able to handle this problem. Uh, so this is why we need to um, unblock all communication under fully our control, but not today. Because today even Armenia is not able to guarantee the uh, security of our communication to its communications. So this is the agenda that we have now. And both, I mean, the West and Russia, they are trying to, to get the presence here in the communication. Sergey, in the course of negotiations, number one, two questions. Number one, what is the problem that Azerbaijan has with an Armenian customs person saying, let me see your visa or your identity card and then let them through? Are they fearing that the Armenians are going to kill them or something? And second, in the course of negotiations, why don't the Armenian side say, uh, let's unblock everything? If there's an Armenian who wants to go to Russia through Azerbaijan, um, don't require anything, the same as you want us not to require something to go through. Why can't it be symmetrical? I'm, I will start from the last question. The problem is that we do not have actually on the agenda the unblocking of all communications. Because now we're discussing only the so-called Zangzur corridor. Because our communi the communications that are relevant for Armenia are out of the agenda. Yeah, that sounds like a defeat in the negotiations to me. Exactly. So this is diplomatic defeat because for us, it's extremely important to have railway connection with Iran. From Yerevan to Yeraz, then Nahijevan, then to Iran. And second, for us, it's important to have a direct railway connection with Russia. But we have Abkhazia-Georgia problem. This is why this communication is not working. Because we do not need the communication to Russia from Armenia, then to, I don't know, Nahijevan, Sunik, Artsakh. Baku and Dagestan, Russia. So this is this is not relevant to have such long communication. And yes, this is out of the agenda, fortunately. And coming to the first question was related to uh, why, why Azerbaijanis yeah. want to. Okay, actually, I do not have answer. I I, I don't know. I mean their position, uh, but I can try to express what do I think because I don't have answer. Maybe they're afraid of um, any Armenian dominance um, towards Azerbaijan. So as far as Azerbaijan won the war, so that they should, should be in dominant position. So Armenians yeah. should, should not be allowed to check or do something. And as they, for example, uh, pushed forward uh, in Article 9 that Azerbaijan has to have an unimpeded access it means there shouldn't be any obstacle from Armenians. So, okay, let's this obstacle be from Russians, but not from Armenians. So Armenians should not be an obstacle for Azerbaijanis. This is as far as I understand. You know, I want to go back to this corridor, you know, zoom out a little bit at a high level. You talked about basically Azerbaijan trying to sell this corridor to the West as part of this uh, middle corridor. Mm -hmm. uh, and but it's at the same time you said that it is now playing this card with Putin in terms of you know well you know Russians could control it. So I wanted to ask: Is a Western controlled corridor? Um, you know, the, the, does does Azerbaijan and Turkey is this a principled issue for Azerbaijan or Turkey? Who controls this corridor? If in the end they will have their access no matter what, meaning that free, unimpeded access, and essentially, basically, Azerbaijan is trying to get the most out of it in this situation. And also, I have to say that uh, Ibrahim Kalin, just as we're talking about this, Ibrahim Kalin was in Baku today. He is the head of Turkish intelligence. Prior, prior to that, he was the spokesperson, I believe, for Erdogan. And he basically said that the so-called Zangezur corridor will open up communications from Central Asia to Europe via Turkey. So who is the main benefactor of this corridor? And, uh, well, is Turkey, let me put it this way, is Turkey a primary benefactor of the Zangezur corridor more than Azerbaijan? And 
the Turkey care whether this corridor is controlled by uh, Western companies or Russia. Let me ask one more question on top of that. Or is it going to be NATO that's able to project power all the way from the West to Central Asia? This is the one of the biggest uh, Azerbaijan and Turkish achievements in the region. The diplomatic goal was to create an international consensus that this corridor should be open. So this is complicated to get any consensus on any issue around the world between West and Russia. But now we see that both West and Russia agreed that this communication should be open. And I do not think that for Azerbaijan and Turkey is important who is going to control this corridor because they will push and use all their efforts in order to uh, get this corridor under their control in the long term run. It means that they will use different toolkit against Russian control or against Western control, but it does not change the goal. So the goal is to have direct land access. That's it. Coming to who will gain more. I will I will read the key the conclusion, key findings of one Turkish experts when I was when we had a meeting and three plus three format. Uh, geopolitical consequences for the region in terms of Zangzo corridor. This presentation in Rush, but I'll translate. Um, strengthening Turkey Azerbaijani alliance, consequence number one. Consequence number two, uh, economic isolation of Armenia. Consequence number two, reducing of Russian and Iranian influence in the region. Consequence number four, increasing the role of Turkey in Europe and NATO. So we didn't think about the last consequence, that Turkey will use uh, the Zangizu corridor as a leverage in in EU and in NATO, because the, the Turkey actually will become the key hub in the region, because there is a competition who will be the key hub, Iran or Turkey in the region. If Turkey is becoming key hub, obviously this is... Um, best case scenario for the collective West because they reduce NATO, Iranian presence in the region. And having Turkey that will be key hub connecting West with Central Asia means that will benefit Turkey, Europe, and Azerbaijan. And uh, Azerbaijan, what was your question? Could you repeat? My question was, uh, in addition to all of these things, will it not benefit NATO to be able to project power all the way from the West yeah. through Turkey to Central Asia? And if we are talking about Russia being very concerned about NATO missiles coming into Ukraine, wait until they come into the Central Asian plateau. There is a problem of perception. There is a, a great book of Mr. Jervis, Perception, Misperception, International Politics. And from Russian perception, yes, Turkey is a member of NATO, but Turkey has, Turkey has a strategic autonomy within NATO. From Iranian perspective, despite Turkey's active role, Turkey is still a member of the NATO. And their interest, I mean, with the collective West actually coincide in the Middle East and in the South Caucasus. So this is why they they call this so-called Zangzo Corridor NATO Turan Dalan. So the corridor of Turan project and NATO project. Mm -hmm. Russians, they do not feel um, these two threats. I mean, the Turan threat is quite mystic for them, so they don't take it serious. And the NATO threat that may rise if the corridor is open, they do not feel so. Because during, um, so they didn't allow it to Turkey have any direct access with Central Asia during uh, Russian Empire time, during Soviet time. And now Russia is actually ready to, um, to open this communication. So this is, it means that they do not feel and do not see such that threat that the Iranians see. Uh, let me just ask this this question, uh, Sergey. Um, the Russian side and Azerbaijani side and Turkish side, I believe, they all make um, references to point number nine of the November 10, uh, 9, 10 statement. And um, I mean, that it, it, it is just a circus because that, that entire document has been violated and raped multiple times none of those points exist what is wrong with armenia just basically pulling out i mean is i mean obviously the answer is that well that may uh, 
create a pretense or causes belly for Azerbaijan to attack again. But can Azerbaijan get away with it this time? The problem is if we leave this agreement, it means that that will be a diplomatic defeat for us in a legal way. Yes, de facto, if you were not able to keep this agreement, I mean, we have nine articles, and the, as far as I understand, the only article number one was actually conducted. I mean, the ceasefire regime. All other points were violated. If you are not able or we have such result that all agreement has violated, and there is only one point that um, two sides are using against you, it means diplomatic defeat. So what Armenia can do is to suggest sign a new deal, a new agreement. As far as this is not relevant anymore. Okay, guys, let's focus on a new agreement uh, because we cannot leave this paper without any bad consequences. I mean, th th that's obvious. That will be, again, diplomatic uh, victory for Azerbaijan. Um, but as, as we see, there is zero uh, discussions about any new trilateral statement. We had four trilateral statements. I mean, Armenia, Russia, and Azerbaijan. And the last was signed in October 2022, right after the Prague. And in the last statements was mentioned that both sides continue negotiations based in Almata declaration. Exactly. They, they just implemented what they agreed in Prague. So that was not a, um, something new that was uh, that arised in the Russian platform. So now maybe we should discuss a new fifth trilateral statement on the highest level and put other points on the agenda. For example, we have points that are not on the agenda now. For example, the issue of um, our refugees, and number one. Number two, the issue of um, Armenian uh, POWs and uh, political military leadership that is in Baku jail. So this is not a part of November 9 deal, according to Azerbaijan. And we do not know any uh, real strong Armenian position on it. Maybe we should put on it on the agenda in a new trilateral statement. Um, if I recall, actually, points one, two, and three had to do with uh, the return of Lachin Corridor and the region, and also the Kelbaja region that had to be given back by November 21 and then December 20th or something like that. So those have been achieved. But points four through eight, uh, and I'm again, I'm working from the top of my head, four through eight have not been achieved. And those had to do with uh, the Artsakhsis being safe, that the Russians were going to have their uh, um, peacekeepers over there. So I have been mystified as to why Armenia cannot look at Russia or Azerbaijan and say, well, let's discuss point nine. But first of all, let's talk about having 150,000 Artsakhsis at home. Let's talk about uh, getting our POWs released from Baku. Let's talk about um, Azerbaijan getting out of Armenian territories, which were taken after November 10, right? All these things are in the agreement and they're violated. And Armenia just basically has absolutely no response in the negotiation process. And I suspect it's because just like Pashinyan said, that he does not raise a number of issues in order to not block the negotiations. They're fearful that they will block negotiations. It's, it's obviously it's the wrong team we're sending to the negotiations. Let me try to explain their perspective. Armenian position is we are conducting um, negotiations with Azerbaijan only on bilateral level. We do not use any mediations anymore uh, because we see that, okay, in Russia, we use Russian mediation, but Russia was not able to use leverage against Azerbaijan. Uh, to force to conduct some points of 2020 statement and other agreements. We agreed on, we did all our unilateral concessions in Western platforms. We recognize Azerbaijani territorial integrity, mentioning 86.6 thousand kilometers. We recognized uh, so called enclaves of Azerbaijani territory. We recognized Artsakh as a part of Azerbaijan. And all the, we did so Western platforms. And Western and West. Uh, also doesn't have leverage on Azerbaijan to force it to conduct other points of deal. So this is why we focus on bilateral bilateral track. Same time, Azerbaijan is using 
Russia in order to make pressure on Armenia that you are also welcome to Russian platform. But as far as Armenia rejects, uh, this leverage is still in Azerbaijani hands because Armenian position is we should focus on bilateral trade. We don't use Russian trade or Western trade. Soon after Russia's clarifications to Iran that last week, um, Secretary of State Blinken made an unannounced call to Pashinyan late on Thursday to discuss the so-called peace process. They call it the peace process, as well as Armenia and U.S. relations. Then on Friday, Russian Deputy Prime Minister Alexei Overchuk arrived in Armenia. What was the urgent need for a discussion between Blinken and Pashinyan right before Overchuk's visit? Also, one more thing. I think that uh, the, the phone call came on the heels of Baku again rejecting Pashinyan's proposal to sign a partial or interim agreement based only on 10 out of the 17 points that have been agreed upon. As far as I understand, for both from the West, for the West and for Armenia, it's important to get any paper from Baku before COP29, because after COP29, the West will lose the last its leverage on Azerbaijan. Because yes, for our lives, the regime is extremely important to have a, this summit on highest level in order to legitimize uh, ethnic cleansing, because they, they, they used also in wording calling the COP29 uh, summit of blah, blah, summit of blah, blah, and summit of peace. Uh, so for, from their perspective, peace is the only, the only way to peace is through ethnic cleansing. And now, if Armenia and West, they do not get the, any paper from Baku, it will be complicated to force Aliyev to continue negotiations. Moreover, to, to give any paper in a short-term run or long-term run, because Azerbaijan, to be honest, does not need such paper. There is no really... Um, need uh, unblocking communication with Armenia or establishing diplomatic relations. There is no need for Baku. Uh, this is why they're trying to use the last window of opportunity until November, until US elections and until COP29. Okay, Pashinyan's overtures to the West have become more and more prominent over the years. In fact, it is now called a, a pivot um so that is going on and a week ago um there was this conference or there was this hearing uh, for at the u.s helsinki commission where uh, they discussed the situation in armenia and one thing that sort of really <laughs> resonated uh with me and uh it was eventually caught by armenian media as well was that the former a U.S. ambassador to the OSC, um, Bayer, uh, when talking about Armenia's uh, relations with Russia, said that the U.S. should do everything possible to uh, essentially break up that relationship. And specifically, he, shed, he said that Armenia should be prepared to endure some cold winters. Around the same time, like two weeks ago, uh, USAID announced a doubling of aid to Armenia with another 130 million in allocation. We don't know where this is going to go. It's improving governance, civil participation in democracy, blah, 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 and also competitiveness. Where do we go from this? Because uh, U.S. officials or former U.S. officials at a official U.S. government hearing are saying that Armenia must endure cold winters. Um, but... You know, the, the amount of, uh, I guess, the amount of aid that, for instance, they announced, which is 130 million, is drops in a bucket compared to what Armenia needs. And uh, if Russia, for instance, uh, if something happened between the trade, in the trade between Russia and Armenia overnight, I mean, that is billions of dollars of trade that has only increased over the last few years. You know, how, how is the West viewing Armenia's pro-Western shift? Is it strategic for them? Is it um, something that can be mutually beneficial for both countries? Or is uh, the West simply like uh, ambassador, former ambassador Bayer said, um, you know, just going to endure some cold, uh, just wants Armenia to endure some cold winters for the sake of West. Let yeah. them eat democracy. Yeah, let them eat democracy. Or 
essentially we don't care you know what armenia has to do we just care about damaging russia is that really the the western calculus here or is there something that we're not seeing that's obvious that the south caucasus is continuing to be a battlefield between russia and the west that's obvious and the problem is that armenia now allies allows to instrumentalize itself uh, Baku, for example, is not doing so because they have their agenda, they have their goals, and they are using both Western and Russian tools against Armenia in order to achieve their goals. But when, for example, what does mean instrumentalizing ourselves? I mean, it's obvious that West is ready to invest in any country who is uh, ready to act against Russia. They have, when, for example, UK, uh, Ukraine stops the war against Russia or tries to make a bilateral deal with Russia without any Western mediation, day after they will um, they will not get any even one dollar from the US or from the EU because they are not ready to be an anti-Western asset against Russia. The same is with Armenia. Until we do anti-Russian sentiments and do anti-Russian steps, we may rely on any kind of Western support, not any kind, but we can, we can uh, expect any Western support. For example, military procurement in uh, political, some di political diplomatic support. But as we see, this is not enough. So this does not mitigate all challenges that we have now. Armenia tries to present in the West that Russia is number one security threat for Armenia. This I hear from Western diplomats. Uh, but as far as I understand, number one threat for me is coming from Baku and from Ankara, not from Moscow. And yes, Baku Ankara now trying to engage Russia in Article 9, etc. But the um, source of the threat is coming from Baku and Ankara. Um, and the problem is Armenia is trying to show to the West that we are you guys and trying to show to Russians that uh, we have some change. This is not pivot. For example, Nikol Pashinyan is going to take part in BRICS summit in Kazan in October. Armenia is going to take part in CIS summit. Then Armenia um, um, decided to uh, withdraw from the Council of Europe statements on ICC on warrant Mr. Putin. So these indicators, uh, these steps may indicate some change in Armenian uh, position towards Russia, but the problem is, as according to Russian experts and diplomats, key decision makers in Moscow they do not trust Pashinyan. So from their perspective, these steps they are performative, but they do not have any content. And uh, the same may, may be from the West uh, that Armenia is doing anti-Russian sentiments and steps in order to get any support. But the problem is, I'm not. I'm I'm convinced that we are not ready to face the negative consequences. I mean, I'm not ready to face a cold winter in Erevan here. I do not think so. In fact, uh, talking about performative, I mean, this is not significant in terms of everything else we've been discussing, but it's important to mention, I think, that uh, there was a press conference held two weeks ago where a journalist... From Pashinyan's own newspaper, asked that was a scripted a question, thing. right? And the, the, it was it was a, basically Anna Hakopian is the head of Armenian Times, and a journalist from Armenian Times asked a question that was derogatory towards Russia, and Pashinyan basically said that uh, you know we shouldn't treat Russia like this or any other country. We should ask you know we should be respectful to them in our questions. And meanwhile, I mean, all of his former, uh, all of his uh, lieutenants uh, in parliament, uh, in government have been uh, attacking Russia every day now for the last uh, two years. So, yes, it does seem like there is some performative uh, statements, uh, you know, warming up to Russia. But as you're saying, it seems like the Russians aren't buying it. The Russians even... Um agreed to have an Armenian ambassador, Gurgen Arsenian, a person who was uh, one of the most vocal on anti-Russian sentiments within the last years. 
Uh, but from Russian perspective, um, they do not be that side who did, is deteriorating Armenia Russia relations. So, okay, if you want to have Arsenian Armenian ambassador to Moscow, despite his like his statements against Russia, okay, we are ready to um, forget it and to accept him as an ambassador. But do not blame us that we are destroying um, Armenia Russia relations. So, this is their position on it. Yeah, Hovig, I was surprised that that performance at the press conference was not recognized at the Emmys last Sunday night. <laughs> Maybe Oscars next time. We'll <laughs> yeah, let's let's see. Um, Sergey, a final uh, quick question. We don't have to dwell very long on this. On October 26, Georgia is going to hold parliamentary elections. The ruling party, Georgian Dream's efforts to rid the country's domestic politics from foreign influence over the past year have led to an acute crisis between Georgia and EU. And the West is painting these upcoming elections as a pivot to the West or a pivot to the East. Can you talk to us a little bit about what's at stake in Georgia and maybe more to the point for us today here? What's at stake for Armenia in these 2024 Georgian parliamentary elections? And in fact, before you answer, Sergei, uh, I just want to say that there's news about this because in response to yet more sanctions from the U.S. against Georgian government officials, essentially Georgia showed uh, some uh, teeth today uh, when uh, the Georgian government basically said that they will need to reevaluate uh, relations between Georgia and the U.S. if the U.S. takes uh, further steps towards uh, these sanctions. So um, since we have been thinking about this question, since we've been thinking about asking Sergei this question, the situation has only deteriorated. As far as I see developments in Georgia, this is not a pivot to Russia, pivot to somewhere else. This is pivot from the West. Uh, because as... Um, the problem is, I mean, for Armenia, that we may be surrounded by countries that actually are fine or would like to be fine with the West, but they are not part of the West. I mean, Turkey is part of NATO. Iran is ready to get a deal with the US. Azerbaijan is fine with the EU. Uh, and Georgia that would like to be fine with the EU, but not under fully Western control. And... Uh, and all four countries are very good with Russians. And in this case, Armenia may be the only country in the region that is surrounded by others that are okay with Russians, but we are acting against Russia. I don't think that this is a best uh, foreign policy strategy. And this is consequence number one. The second is that might be important, actually we are discussing now what may happen. As we see many Mm, activists and many opinion leaders um, are not allowed to visit Georgia. For example, I, Arsene Haratian was not allowed to, to cross Armenia border, Georgia, Armenia, Georgia border. Uh, Armen Haratian was an advisor on, to Nikol Pashinyan on foreign policy. And he's uh, good, he's for long, for many years, was working with the Western agencies. And Georgia is trying to reduce the Western influence on its uh, on its citizen. And after this law that was accepted, actually, on foreign agents, uh, maybe some Georgian uh, organizations will move to Armenia in order to have a legal base for their like actions, because they will they do not have enough capacity and opportunity to stay in Georgia until they are foreign agents. So it means that many of them will come to Armenia. The fundings from the West to, um, to, to this organization in order to use them as a tool against ruling elite in Georgia will increase. And yes, we may be the, um, I mean, in this scenario, Armenia may become the, uh, the only Western, the Western oasis here in the South Caucasus. But but is it possible that this pivot from the West may turn into normalization of relations with Russia eventually? And this may be a crazy scenario that I'm talking about, 
but is it possible that uh, for Russia one day to accept uh, that uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia may actually join Georgia? Um, I mean, this may be sort of crazy because I think for some Georgians it might be crazy, but uh, if Russia made such a move, would that be like a, a killer chess move that would change the geopolitics of the region even more in Russia's favor? Um, and we're thinking specifically about the Abkhazia railroad towards Russia that Armenia would benefit from if these relations warmed up. To be honest, I do not exclude such scenario because, for example, we had a statement from uh, Ivanishvili that we are ready to um, apologize and say that we are very sorry for the war that Saakashvili uh, launched against uh, South Ossetia. It means that Georgia is ready to change its um, approach towards Abkhazia and South Ossetia. And maybe in this case, that might be acceptable any any form of reunification uh, within extremely high autonomous status, close to really independent status, etc. And only, but that's important to know that only if such development is acceptable for Abkhazia and South Ossetia, that will be acceptable and implemented. If they will be, in case of they're against, Russians uh, will not able to force actually them. Uh, and as we see, there are really high level tensions between Russia and Abkhazia now. Um, the, a lot of developments inside the political leadership uh, is taking place last weeks. Uh, but yes, we see that Georgia is ready to uh, get Abkhazia and South Ossetia back, but yes, they should do more steps on this way. Yes, this that might be a best case scenario. I mean, the uh, the railway connection um, for Armenia, because um, as far as I see, we will get less talks about Armenian isolation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And Georgia actually is conducting um, many uh, infrastructure projects. I mean. Uh, not the railway connection, but for vehicles to have a high speed connection with north, uh, north and south. So again, Armenia will benefit will benefit from it. All right, let's wrap up our topics here. I'd like to ask each of you now uh, if there's been something on your mind in the past week or two or month or whatever that you would like to talk about. Uh, Sergey, um, something on your mind that you would like to share? One of the most important names. For me, that was last week, that was Artsakh Republic's Independence Day. And I think despite zero official statements, etc., this is extremely important to keep um, this, um, this story on the agenda. I mean, we always, I always talk with my students uh, about it, with my colleagues, I mean, foreign colleagues, not Armenians one. And only keeping this historical memory uh, will allow us to, uh, in the long term run, understand who we are actually 100 years later. Aspet, the only thing I would like to mention is COP29, which is the hashtag that Azerbaijan is using to promote its whitewashing scheme to whitewash the genocide of Artsakh that happened a year ago. And I would urge everyone to follow that hashtag to reply, to like content that you agree with, and to make sure essentially, essentially that our message is heard. We need to free our hostages. We need to free our prisoners. And your participation in this media effort is very important. So please consider helping out by searching for the COP29 hashtag and uh, participating in the social media debate. Thank you. All right, let's leave it there for today. Thank you, Sergey, for joining us. Very much Thank appreciated. Merci, Shot. Thank you. All right, that's our show. We hope you found it useful. Please find us on social media and follow us everywhere you get your Armenian news. The links are in our show notes. If you feel that we're doing a good job, please help us increase our reach by subscribing to our Patreon or buying us a coffee through Buy Me a Coffee. Thank you in advance. Please like, share, and comment on this podcast episode, especially if you're watching this on YouTube. This helps us immensely. Thank you to Laura Osborne for the music on our podcast, and most importantly, thank you. 
We'll talk to you soon.